Welcome to Grace Bible Fellowship. So glad that you could join us. Before we get into John chapter 5, why don't you pray with me? Father, as we look into your word, we know that it was written so long ago to so many different types of people. And Lord, as we look at it, we might not understand what it is that you mean unless we look at it closely. So, Father, I pray that your Holy Spirit would assist us as we look at it, that you might help us to understand what it says, but more so what it means and how we should behave how it should motivate our lives for you, that we might please you, that not only would we understand it with our minds, but we would be obedient to do your good, pleasing, and perfect will with our lives. So, Lord, be with us, especially at this difficult time with people inside of their homes. Pray that you might bring us peace, strength, comfort, and guidance by your word. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so we were in chapter 5, we were in chapter 4 last week of 1 John. 1 John, of course, is all about all of these things encouraging us as Christians and what we believe. And what I'm titling this section is, Do You Know the Son? And of course, uh, if you were to see Jesus, you might not recognize him because this is probably what he'd look like. But, you know, he's got all the right features. So, uh, as, we, as we get into the scriptures, we're going to begin in chapter 5, verse 1. John has just told us that the quintessential ingredient for somebody who is a Christian is love. And that you can't say that you know God and not have love. If you don't have love for those who are closest to you, and in fact the world, then you're not of God because you can't be. If you can't love the people you see who are made in his image, how can you love God who created them in his image and say you love him but you don't love them? And it's, uh, it's an interesting uh, premise. But as we go, let's just pick it up and read it. Whoever believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. And everyone who loves him, who begot, also loves him who is begotten of him. By this we know that we love the children of God, when we love God and keep his commandments. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments. And his commandments are not burdensome. For whatever is born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Who is he who overcomes the world but he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? This is he who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ, not only by water, but by water and blood. And it is the Spirit who bears witness, because the Spirit is truth. For there are three that bear witness in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit. And these three are one. And there are three that bear witness on earth, the Spirit, the water, and the blood. And these three agree as one. If we receive the witness of men, the witness of God is greater, for this is the witness of God, which he has testified of his Son. He who believes in the Son of God has the witness in himself. He who does not believe God has made him a liar because he has not believed in the testimony that God has given of his Son. And this is the testimony, that God has given us eternal life. And this life is in his Son. He who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have life. These things I have written to you believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life, and that you may continue to believe in the name of the Son of God. So as we look at the passage, let's go through it a little at a time, because there's a whole lot of information here. It begins by saying, whoever believes that Jesus is the Christ, is born of God, that Jesus is the Messiah, the chosen one of God to come and save us as lost people, which means you have to believe you're a lost people first. And everyone who loves him who begat, or who begot, also loves him who is begotten of him. And I'll talk about that. By this we know that we love the children of God, when we love God and keep his commandments. So the first thing is, he says, whoever believes in Jesus Christ is born of God, and everyone who loves him who begot also loves him who is begotten of him. In other words, if you love Jesus, you're going to love his people. If you love the one who is begotten by God, you're going to love his people. You're going to, and it's a continuation from chapter 4. And Jesus says here in First John chapter 1, we went over this previously, 
Who is a liar but he who denies that Jesus is the Christ? He is Antichrist who denies the Father and the Son. Whoever denies the Son does not have the Father either. He who acknowledges the Son has the Father also. Jesus is explaining to us throughout the New Testament that if you reject him, you have rejected God's gift and his very special offspring. He is God in human form. If you reject him, you reject God. And if you reject God, you've rejected his people. And it's just that simple. So here's an interesting site, if you recognize this, is the Dome of the Rock, which you find in Jerusalem. It is built on the site where the Muslims believe that Ishmael was almost offered up by Abraham. And if you're aware of the true story, you know it wasn't Ishmael. And they also believe that this is uh, when, when he had a, a dream, he ended up coming to this place and ascending to heaven. So it's one of the sacred places. It's not really a, a, a mosque. It's a shrine, really, built to Muhammad. There's an interesting thing written on it in Arabic. If you don't read Arabic, you wouldn't catch it. But if you've ever visited, it says this, Allah is one. He does not beget, nor is he begotten, and there is none like him. It's found in the Quran in Surah 112. This is in direct opposition to what's being taught here in the scripture, that God does not have a begotten son, and it's written specifically against Christianity and against Jesus. It's the total opposite of what's being spoken here. In the first century, John was dealing with some folks that didn't believe that Jesus was truly who he was. They believed he was a sacred teacher, that he had the Christ spirit. There were all sorts of things. This, this heresy that came in, John is writing later to, to Ephesus to kind of undo this mess. They believed that when Jesus walked, he didn't leave footprints, for instance, because he wasn't in a physical form. And so all of this, the Gnostics were the group of people that said this. They were coming against the church and saying, well, Jesus was just one of many enlightened teachers and, and so on and so forth. So you may have heard all this baloney. Jesus claims very clearly that he is the one and only begotten Son of God. And if you don't have him, then you don't have God. Simple, bottom line. And if you don't realize that Jesus is and you don't attest to who he says he is, it's that Jesus, not the historical good teacher, nice guy, taught good stuff. Not that Jesus, but the Jesus that he says he is, the very Son of God. If you don't have him, you don't have the Father. It's just that simple. Um, although very disturbing. So that is what is written on here. Um, it's funny, Allah was actually one of many idols in which Abraham used to worship. It was only one, it was the moon god, which uh, is why they have the symbol the way they do. So it's, a, it's an interesting thing. I, it's an interesting thing here in chapter 2. It says, by this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep his commands. So I know that I love his people when I obey his commands. Well, that's an interesting thing. It's said backwards before. We know that we love God when we love his kids, when we love his children. But now it says, we know that we love his children because we obey his commands. That's rather interesting. Uh, it, so how does our commandment keeping reveal our love for others? Certainly, if I obey God's commandments, what he tells me to do, it's good for everyone else. How does it show that I really care about everyone else? Well, all you have to do is go to the Old Testament. Just take the Ten Commandments, the Big Ten, found in, in uh, Exodus 20. Don't worship other gods. Don't make idols and bow down and worship them. Don't misuse the name of God. Don't take it in vain. Uh, and there are a lot of Christians that do this and don't know that they do it. And it's not using Jesus Christ as a swear word. It's saying, God told me this thing. When God didn't tell you this thing. It's an impression. It's a feeling. It's your imagination. But God didn't tell you, and you better not do it because you're taking God's name in vain. You're speaking on behalf of him when he did not send you. Shame on you when that happens. You keep the Sabbath day holy. You remember that it was God who created the Sabbath day as a rest for us. It wasn't for him. He wasn't tired at the end of everything. He, he wasn't tired. He made it for us. Honoring your father and mother. All of everything that you see, it goes all the way to the, to the bottom. How does that show when we love God and we keep his commandments? How does that show we love other people? Well, I'm not going to be hawking your stuff, and I'm not going to be looking and figuring out how I'm going to rip you off. And so that's going to benefit you when I keep the commandments. So as I keep the commandments, I'm going to become the best citizen, the best Christian, the best brother, the best friend, the best husband. I'm going to be the best that I could possibly be when I obey God's commands. When I don't obey his commands, it's going to suck to be you because I'm just going to be selfish. It's going to be about me. 
It's going to be what I can get from you. And if I have to murder from you, steal from you, if I'm going to wish I had everything that you had, if, if that's the, the way I'm going to live and I let myself go so that I don't care about God or I don't care about people, well, it's going to be, it's going to be a hard time on the world. In fact, they're talking about uh, defunding the police now because of a, an incident that occurred. I can only imagine what would happen if there were no police, if there was no army, if there was no one to enforce the laws of this country. Can you imagine the man? And we show that we love God's people when we obey God's commands because our sin always affects other people. You know, people think, well, there's, there's no real victim with this. Your sin affects everyone in your life. When I'm not right with God and I'm not keeping his commandments, you can be sure it's going to come out in the way that I treat you, in the way that I talk to you, the way that I, I ignore you or I approach you or I care about you, all of that is going to be changed by the way I submit myself to God. And it's the same for you. Your sin doesn't affect just you. It affects everyone around you. And that's what it means. So Jesus was very clear about it as well. When he was one of the lawyers came up and they wanted to kind of test Jesus. They wanted to, you know, stump the teacher, which you get people do that sometimes. It says, teacher, which is the great commandment of the law? And Jesus said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. And this is the first and great commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. And on these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Jesus broke it down in the New Testament. These are the most important things. Love God with everything you have. And love your neighbor the way you love yourself. If you, if you take care of yourself well, you should take care of your neighbor well. If you don't take care of yourself well, well then shame on you. You're not taking care of that which God created and God loved and God died for. So, you know, that needs to change. But he, he assumes that we're going to love ourselves, take care of ourselves, feed ourselves, care for ourselves. So why wouldn't we do that for other people? And if we don't, well, then we're showing prejudice for one reason or another. So the scripture is very, very clear. This is how we can love other people is to love God and keep his commandments. And verse 3, for this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments. And his commandments are not burdensome. It's interesting, when before I became a Christian, I always thought I didn't want to become a Christian because God had all these laws and rules and stuff that I had to do, and I didn't want to do any of it. I didn't want to read the Bible, didn't want to pray, that I was sit and listen to some man yell at me during a service and you know, it's in the name of preaching God's word. Jesus is very clear in John 14, 15. He says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. And it's interesting, uh, it, his commandments are all found within the pages of the Bible. The 66 books, which go from Old to New Testament, uh, from Genesis to Revelation, are the declared commandments of God. This is God's will for our life. And when we keep with those things, everything works well. It's a little like the manufacturer's handbook. If you do everything the manufacturer says that you should do with your product, you probably won't break it from being stupid. Like your washer. You don't wash rocks in your washing machine. Uh, you, you don't put motorcycle parts in the dryer. I mean, they're... There are things that you don't do. They probably don't have that in the manual, but trust me, it should be. So this is what God tells us to do, and if we don't look into it and understand what he's saying, then we certainly won't understand what he wants. Psalm 119, David writing from verse 9 to 16 says, How can a young man cleanse his way, even a young man, driven by <laughs> imbecilic passion sometimes and uh, lack of knowledge, ignorance, and sometimes just uh, flat out, Never mind. Anyway, I'm thinking of me. How can a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed according to your word. With my whole heart I have sought you. Oh, let me not wander from your commandments. Your word I have hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. And that, that I think, speaks something about memorizing God's word. It's been helpful in my life. Blessed are you, O Lord, teach me your statutes. With my lips I have declared all of the judgments of your mouth. I have rejoiced in the way of your testimonies as much as in all riches. I will meditate on your precepts and contemplate your ways. I will delight myself in your statutes and I will not forget your word. You get the idea that David was in love with God and in love with obeying. Like, God, I love you so much. I just want to do whatever's going to please you, whatever's going to make you happy like a son, like a proud son would do for a father that he loved. And I don't know about you, but sometimes we can lose that relationship and it becomes nothing more than law-keeping. 
it keeps it's just a line by line thing that you get stuck in and we call that religion which is stale and old and it's like an engine uh, or it's like a car without an engine you've lost the very heart of the thing and Jesus uh, teaches us that it's about obeying his commandments but we have to have a right heart about it too it can't just be uh, I, I do it out of this sort of religious observance or I do this out of some debt I'm trying to pay off which is the worst uh, you know, I need to be a good boy because I was such a bad boy for so long and still am. Uh, so I need to cover up and pretend and put on a happy face. That's just hypocrisy. So as we move on, his burdensome commandments. They're not burdensome. By the way, there's a bus under all those people. This is actually in India. This is not Photoshop. This is what people do. And 2 Corinthians 9 verses 6 to 7 tells us something of the heart of this thing. But I... But this I say, he who sows sparingly, that is to plant, will also reap sparingly, and he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. So let each one give as he purposes in his heart, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. So the same principle that applies to our giving has everything to do with what we give to the Lord, which is our every word, every where we go, everything we do, every one we see, every word we say, everything we invest in, uh, every aspect of our lives. If God wants a cheerful giver, and if we're going to give it begrudgingly, if we're going to give of our lives from some kind of a duty or some kind of a, uh, a role or, or being responsible, uh, it, it lacks the luster and the love. If you had a kid that just did what he was told and never did anything on his own and he didn't do it because he loved you, what would you think of that relationship? You, you could, as a father, you could be replaced tomorrow and it might even be a better situation if that was the case. So I don't want to be that kind of a child that doesn't have a heart for God, that doesn't love him with all my heart because I'm alive and because I can stand on two feet and I survived COVID and all the things that God has brought us through and given us, I'm just grateful. And I hope you are too. And I hope that your love for God is something that's seen in the way that you obey God. And his burdensome, his commandments are not a burden. You're not walking around like, oh, I got to go to church on Sunday. Oh, I got to, you know, all the things that we know that God would have us do. Uh, I've never heard, seen anybody complain about taking a break one day on seven, but, you know, you can find a way to complain about those things, too, because we're just complainers at heart. So it's not a burden. In Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 to 30, Jesus says this, Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart. That means humble. And you will find rest for your souls. He's speaking on a spiritual level here, not something physical. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Jesus says, if you come to me, I'm going to take it really, really easy on you because I love you and I care about you. It's understanding that underneath everything is God's love. And anything that he does in our lives, no matter what it is, he does for our benefit because he cares for us. Without that understanding, you will misunderstand so many things in your life. The difficult things that you've gone through to become the person that you are today, you will see them as God being angry or vindictive or paying you back for your stupidity uh, or for some willful thing that you've done or some ancestral sin that your parents have committed. And none of that is true. There are things I look back on in my life and I say, you know, I wouldn't have compassion on people who were drug addicts unless I was a drug addict. I wouldn't have compassion on people that were stuck in their sin unless I was stuck in my sin. I wouldn't have a lot of things that are going on in my life if it wasn't for the hardships I had. And I hope you can look back and see the very hand of God, the signature on every single thing that's been passed your way, because God intends it for your good. And if you don't understand that, you're not seeing it from his point of view. In fact, you're probably seeing it from a very self-centered point of view. So, Jesus says, come to him, they're not burdensome. For whatever is born of God overcomes the world, and this is the victory that has overcome the world our faith. You see, because I believe that God is in control of all things and that he loves me, there is nothing that's going to come my way that God can't control, stop, or mitigate in some way, shape, or form. And so that understanding of who God is, that understanding of the truth of that, is something that 
you, you can get in my face and yell at me all day long and it's not going to bother me because I know that God has some purpose in it. And maybe you've got a problem, maybe I can help you. I'm not going to become offended and get, get all wounded and, you know, need, need to go find myself a little animal or a safe space or whatever, or a safe word. Or, I don't need any of that stuff because I know that God loves me. And whatever it is that you intend, if, if you're going to do something to me, God already knows about it. And I'm going to have to entrust myself that he's going to take care of me. Uh, you try to hurt somebody I love, I will be the very hand of God on you. But uh, as far as being personal, Jesus teaches me another way. So here's the deal. Matthew 12, 18 to 21 says, Behold, my servant, whom I have chosen, my beloved, in whom my soul is well pleased, I will put my spirit upon him, and he will declare justice to the Gentiles. He will not quarrel or cry out, nor will anyone hear his voice in the streets. A bruised reed he will not break, and a smoking flax he will not quench, till he sends forth justice to victory, and in his name, Gentiles will trust. It's basically a statement from Isaiah, which is quoted in the New Testament, about the very character and heart of Jesus. A smoking whack, a smoking wick he won't extinguish. I mean, uh, he'll, he'll fan it until it finally becomes a flame. Or a bruised reed that falls and it looks like, well, this thing is going to die. Uh, he, he, he doesn't extinguish. He doesn't, he doesn't break it off and say, well, you're done for in other words, no matter what little bit of hope there is in you, God's not done giving up on you, although you may have given up on him a long time ago. That's the character of our God, and there is victory in that because you can trust in a God that loves you like that. I don't trust myself because I let myself down all the time, but I can trust in a God that loves me beyond all of that. Next passage, it's 1 Corinthians 15, 54 to 57. So when this corruptible, Paul is speaking of our physical bodies, has put on incorruption, this is when we're resurrected into heaven, and this mortal has put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your sting? O Hades, where is your victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through the Lord Jesus Christ. There's a lot of information I could preach on that just for 45 minutes. I won't. Uh, God help me. So, the reason I don't like to die is because I don't like what's going to happen on the other side. I mean, besides the pain part and uh, my heart stopping and uh, saying goodbye to everybody that I love and everything that I've built in this world, including my children, my grandchildren, and so forth, there's this sense that I'm going to face God for all the things that I've done and how I've rebelled and I've given him the finger and called him all sorts of things. And I'm going to have to stand before God on the basis of the things that I've done and it's not, it's not going to go well for me. Because standing before God on this side when I have the freedom of life is one thing. On the other side, when my life is over and my, all my chips are cashed in, it's done. Whatever you've done in life is over. And if you have the sun, you have life. If you don't, you don't. What's the sting of death? That I'm not ready. What's the, what's the rejoicing in Hades? Well, it's that you've done wrong, and the law stands against you as a witness and says, you haven't done all the right things. But guess what? Jesus took upon himself the law, perfected the law, performed the law perfectly, and died in my place. So when I stand before God, I stand before him with the righteousness that Jesus has purchased for me. And so do you, if you've come to know Jesus Christ in a relationship. Other than that, you're going to have to stand on your own two feet, and they're going to go to the videotape. And you're going to have to give an explanation for everything that you've done. Uh, that's called the Great White Throne Judgment in the book of Revelation. But anyway. So, what overcomes the world is our faith. It's evidence that we have faith, is that we overcome. There are things that you can look behind, these mile markers, you know, these, these stanchions that you've gotten over and gotten through. And say, you know, I used to be this dirty, rotten, horrible, terrible person, and now God has brought me and... and taught me and walked me through these things where I'm not the same person that I once was. That's sort of an overcoming faith when there are difficulties in your life and they're now behind you and there are more and more of those and less and no, less of those in front of you. That is one of the evidences that you have a relationship with God because normal people, even if you're a super self-help guru, you run out because you just don't have the strength to do good enough. You just don't and you always fail. I have great aspirations and I never get there. Um, uh, chapter 7 of Romans is very good when Paul explains that. But 
Overcoming faith is one of those things that is evidence that you have a relationship with God himself. Verse 5, who is he who overcomes the world but he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? It says in John 16, 31 to 33, Jesus answered them and said, Do you know, do you now believe? Indeed, the hour is coming, yes, has now come, that you will be scattered, He's speaking to his disciples, each to his own, and will leave me alone. And that's exactly what his disciples did. They all scattered when he, was, when he got taken in. And yet I am not alone, because the Father is with me. These things I have spoken to you, that in me you may have peace. And in the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. This is Jesus speaking to his disciples, knowing that every one of them is going to run like a rat from a sinking ship. And he says, listen, don't, don't get too crazy about this, because I've overcome the world. All of the things that you're going to fall by, I've already overcome, and it's a done deal. It's something that is settled, and it's over. And Jesus is comforting the disciples who will turn their back on him, and Peter himself, who denies him three times, the guy who seems to be the, uh, you know, the real spearhead of the disciples, he's the one who ends up giving up. So knowing God is evidenced by our overcoming faith. In Romans 8.37, Yet in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. That's the, that's the conclusion of Romans chapter 8 of all of these things about the love of God. You know, what can separate us from the love of God? Nothing can. And if you have a relationship with him where you've accepted Christ as your Savior, that's the kind of a God that you serve. It's not a God who wants to put burdens on your back. It's not the kind of a God that will just forsake you and leave you dangling. He just will not. It's believing that Jesus is the Son of God. That is where all of, of the benefits come to us, is just by believing what the Scriptures teach. 1 Corinthians 15, 57 says, But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through the Lord Jesus Christ. Because God did not design us to live in slavery to our own bodies, our own imagination, our own society, our own upbringing, our own income level. God did not leave us to just get taken over by these things where we're robots programmed by, or even by your own genetic code. God says he can be the Lord of our lives and change all of it. So I believe that we have the victory. I know that I certainly have, and I've got stories upon stories I won't bore you with at this point. Evidence that we know him is an overcoming faith. Verse 6, this is he who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ, not only by water, but by water and blood. And it is the Spirit who bears witness, because the Spirit is truth. Now, if I ask for a show of hands of how many people have no idea what he's talking about right there, I'd probably get a bunch of people. He came by water and blood. And Jesus Christ, not only by water, by water and blood. And the Spirit bears witness, because the Spirit is truth. So, guess what? There are three witnesses. There's water, there's blood, and the Spirit of God, which he has left here with us. Uh, Jesus talks about in the New Testament. Water, blood, and spirit. These are the three witnesses. A lot of people identify the water as being when Jesus was baptized. If you remember, he went down into the water with John the, baptize, uh, the baptizer. I hate to call him a Baptist because he's not a Pentecostal or a Baptist or anything, but he's a baptizer. And put him down in the water. He comes up and the Spirit of God falls on him and a voice from heaven says, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. That evidence, that those who were there heard what was said and is believed John was one of the disciples of John the baptizer. So here's this evidence. There's this evidence of the water when he was baptized that God spoke from heaven, the Holy Spirit was present, and Jesus was being baptized. So right there you have the Trinity, which is kind of an interesting thing, which is also three witnesses. Number two, the blood, which is the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross. During the Passover, when a lamb would be sacrificed yearly for the sins of the people according to God's word, Jesus, God's only son, comes, firstborn male, and dies for the sins of all the people. Jesus was foreshadowed by everything that's in the Old Testament, and it, it's all you have to do is look. So it, the testimony was of the water, of the blood, and also of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit that comes, and in at least two ways, guides us. Number one, 
He's through God's word, which was inspired by the Holy Spirit. So it's directed by his spirit and also internally. We are said to be the temples of God because he inhabits us. Much like the spirit of God inhabited the Old Testament temple, God inhabits us when we come to know Jesus as our Savior. So how do we bear this out? Well, the spirit of God is inside of us and counsels us and guides us into all understanding. As the scripture teaches us, the Holy Spirit does. And we remember the Spirit of God that way. We remember the sacrifice of Jesus when we take of the cup and the bread. We remember him in the communion, which is a testimony and a remembrance. And he said, every time you do this, do this in remembrance of me. And the third time we do this is through baptism. We are baptized and we commit ourselves to God. It is a symbol of our death where we go down into the water as though dead. And we're brought up into newness of life. It happens when you repent of your sins, you give your life to Christ, and as a symbol of this birth, washing, and new life, you get baptized and you share your testimony with everybody. We had a great time last summer doing that. Hopefully we'll have people who are willing to do that again. Interesting passage. One of the interesting things is, and I haven't found a commentator to back me up, but when it says that there are three, the water and the blood and the spirit, it's interesting because when it speaks of the water, I think it might have to do not necessarily with the baptism. It might have to do with Jesus' natural birth. He wasn't an angel that floated down from heaven. He wasn't some kind of a creature other than a human being. He was 100% human, and he came by water. There's an amniotic sac in which a woman has, and, and a baby is born. And you say, well, that's, that's an interesting take. I haven't found anybody actually agrees, except for Jesus in John chapter 3, because he uses this symbol. I'll share it with you. In John 3, verses 3 to 36, Jesus answers and says to Nicodemus, as Nick at night comes to him asking questions, he says, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can't he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Which... Nicodemus isn't an idiot. He's not really thinking literally of doing such a thing. He's basically saying, how can an old dog learn new tricks? And Jesus answered and said, most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and of spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. And then Jesus explains in another verse what he meant. That which is born of flesh is flesh. That which is born of spirit is spirit. And Jesus says, you shouldn't be amazed that I tell you, you should be born again. So he says, unless you have a natural birth, born of water, born of a woman, which Jesus was, the Virgin Mary, and unless you're born in spirit, where you give your life to God and you ask God to come and fill you in, make you a new person, you don't have life in you. You don't have this born-again experience. And so I think Jesus, because John is writing to the Gnostic, he's trying to explain to them that Jesus was a real human being, really God and really man. At the same time, he had a natural birth and he had a real death. All of that would stand in the face of those who said when Jesus walked, he never left footprints uh, or that he had the Christ spirit. And when he was sacrificed, the Christ spirit left him and went on to another and all this other stuff. There was this heresy that was going through the Ephesian church. And it's been handed down and you have people like the Jehovah Witnesses and the Mormons and the, all these people that still buy into this nonsense that Jesus is not who he said he was very clearly. If you don't have the Son of God, the true Son of God, if you don't believe in Jesus other than the historical figure, if you don't believe him as God, then you don't have Jesus and you don't have the Father either. Moving on, verse 7. And there are three that bear witness in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit. And these three are one. And there are three that bear witness on earth, the Spirit, the water, and the blood. And these three agree as one. Now, there are lots of people who have criticism about this passage. In fact, if you have the NIV or some of the other newer versions, you'll see a little footnote in your Bible that says, these verses are not found in the oldest, most reliable transcripts. Which means the oldest, most reliable transcripts that we have don't have this, these two verses in it. And so someone thinks that there was some well-meaning person who kind of wrote them in, and there are people uh, like the Jehovah Witnesses who tell you, we didn't see anything until the 14th century, where anything like the triune God and the Trinity existed. So these two verses are a very blatant attempt at somebody to erase this. It's interesting, though. There are, there are three other passages in the scriptures 
that also are not in the oldest, most reliable transcripts. I have them listed here. John chapter 8, the woman who was caught in adultery, thrown at his feet, where everybody dropped their rocks and walked away, and Jesus said, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. That whole incident is not found in the oldest, most reliable transcripts. And then in Mark 16, 15, it says, These is how, this is how you can tell the disciples of mine. They will drink poison. They won't harm them. They'll handle snakes, and they won't be, uh, they won't be hurt. Uh, they will speak in other tongues. All, when that whole passage that talks about the supernatural, about the Spirit of God, which did follow those who followed Jesus in the first century. You can see it. In fact, uh, the book of Acts shows us all of these things that happen. Romans chapter 8, the fir very first verse, there is therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, who don't walk according to the flesh, but the Spirit. That passage is not found in the oldest, most reliable transcripts. So we have to throw that one out too. Some well-meaning person uh, infused it in there for Paul, so they think. And then uh, the fourth one is the three that are in heaven, the Father, the Word, which is a word for Jesus, the Logos, and the Holy Spirit. So how do you reconcile this? How can you trust that the Bible is reliable and that these verses were intended by the original author? Well, the interesting thing is we have things that predate the oldest, most reliable transcripts. We have the early church fathers. We have people like Polycarp and uh, Serentis, and we have all of these early church fathers, which, by the way, their works are published and written down, and they preach on every one of those verses. So before there was the Masoretic text, before there was any of those things that we call the oldest, most reliable texts, we had people preaching on who Jesus Christ was from a first-person point of view or a second-hand point of view, like Polycarp, the disciple of John the disciple. So we have older manuscripts that predate that, that validate these passages. Just so you know, if anyone brings that up, especially a Jehovah Witness, who would love to see this erased from the Scripture because it talks about a triune God, the Trinity, which they don't believe in. Uh, they don't even believe Jesus is the very Son of God. So uh, just so that you know, um, that, that has been your uh, college education moment for the day. Uh, sermons are delivered by these pre-church, uh, these early church fathers that predate all four of them. All four of these texts were preached on, so you can rely upon these passages. So the Trinity is a thing that the Bible teaches, and you certainly don't need this passage to teach it, by the way. There are many other passages that refer to the Trinity, that uh, we, we see the Spirit of God is a He, and that He is um, grieved when we sin, and that He's put inside of us as a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance. There are all of these things, and you can't grieve a thing. You can grieve a someone, and the Spirit is called a He. It's not called an It. The Spirit is an it. That's not what the Scripture teaches. Verse 9. If we receive the witness of men, the witness of God is greater. For this is the witness of God, which he has testified of his Son. He who believes in the Son of God has this witness in himself. He who does not believe God has made him a liar, because he has not believed the testimony that God has given of his Son. It sounds like a lot of legalese, right? Uh, this testimony. We certainly believe the testimony of man. Um, in fact, if we pick up the, uh, our phone and it says something on the internet, we believe it. Uh, judges hear cases and they try to figure out what's true and what's not true. And there is a sense in which we believe what people say. So if you believe what people say, if you can believe what the headlines say, if you can believe that there was a man named George Washington who crossed the Delaware, if you can believe anything that comes on your cell phone in the way of news, uh, even though we understand there is fake news, then why don't you believe that Jesus is who he said he was? Why is it you can't base this on the most reliable transcript that there ever has been? And certainly there's evidence. We believe in somebody like Nero Claudius, uh, um, the emperor, uh, Augustus. Certainly you believe that he existed. So why can't you believe that Jesus is who he says he is? In fact, we only have one copy of Caesar and everybody believes everything about him, and yet we have many copies, thousands of copies of the scriptures. And yet, because we're ignorant, because we don't understand what the scriptures say, or, or where they came from, or how we got them, we just kind of discount them, almost like a, an old historical document. And yet, it is the very life to those who have a relationship with God, because it is God's word to us, inspired by the Holy Spirit. And so... If you believe men, which we certainly do, in fact, I, I believe most people, they tell me something, I go, really? I just kind of believe it un until I see that there's a reason not to, unless it's completely uh, against all truth that I understand. Um, 
If we believe in these witnesses, why don't we believe God? Because this is the testimony that God has sent his only son to die for our sins. And this is the testimony that God has given us eternal life, and this life is in his son. He who has the son has life. He does not have the son of God, does not have life. Even as Jesus said in John chapter 14, verse 6, Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. It's a very, very exclusive statement that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by him. Very exclusive. John 10.10, 10, Jesus says, A thief does not come except to steal and to kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. Jesus promises those who give their lives to him that they will have real life. Not the semblance of a life, not a pretend life, not a put on life, a real life. And in the last passage, John 3.36, Jesus said, He who believes in the Son has eternal life. He who does not believe in the Son shall not see life. Notice it's very much like the passage we're looking at, and yet Jesus adds this, but the, the wrath of God abides on him. If you haven't submitted your life to the leadership of Jesus Christ in your life, you are under the wrath of God. And everything that you try to do or accomplish in life that you think is going to be significant, you will always be disappointed because you stand at odds with coming under the authority of God. And that's just the way that it is. And it happens to me as well. Even though he's changed me and rebuilt me and made me a new person, if I harden my heart and if I get willful and I pull away, it's like a gigantic rubber band and I just don't make very much headway until I give up and say, God, you're right and I'm wrong. And then I have real life. I have life abundantly. Verse 13, these things I have written to you, this is John the author, these things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life, and that you may continue to believe in the name of the Son of God. Now this is one of seven times that John says, this is why I have written to you, so that you might know something. Know that you have eternal life. If you accepted Christ and you've seen him evidenced in your life, know that there's a life after this that you haven't earned that you receive as a free gift. And eternal life is not something that happens just then. It's something that begins today. The day that you accept God's leadership in your life, that is when eternal life begins because you will never die, Jesus says. You'll never die in your spirit. If, you, if you're born once, you're going to have to die twice. If you're born twice, you're only going to have to die once. If you're born physically and you're born spiritually, the only death that you'll suffer is physical death. But if you're born and born again, you're going to spend eternity with Christ, and the only death that you'll have is, is physical death. But if you've had a physical life, and that's it, you're going to have to die physically and spiritually, be separated from God for all eternity. And that will be the state of your eternal life. So it is something, it is not a game. It is something to take extremely serious. It is the biggest question that needs to be answered by every human being, is where do you stand with God, and why do you think you can stand before him? So, the Bible, I don't know if you've had time to read it, if you soak in it daily. I don't know about you, but I love to take a shower, a good hot shower. And I notice when I first take a shower, I smell different than when I'm done taking a shower. Uh, I can smell the sweat, and, and uh, if I was cutting the lawn, I can smell the lawn being removed from me. And eventually I start to smell like nice smelling soap, and I smell clean, and, and that's the way it's supposed to be. When I get into scriptures, that very same thing happens with my soul. I begin to understand more of who God is, and some of the things in this world which weigh heavy upon my heart, suddenly I realize they're not as important as I thought they were. And the answers that I thought I would have to take uh, into my own hands, I don't have to because God is in charge. So I just want you to know that you can trust that God is who he said he is, and Jesus did love you enough to give his life. And so we should respond rightly. So do you know the Son? Do you have a relationship? It's not a creed that you adopt. It's not a church that you attend. It's not a, a set of laws that you obey. It's a person that you come into relationship with. And everything from there on changes. I trust that if you've been hearing of my voice 
and you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ, that he would touch your heart and he would help you to understand who he is. And if, if you know him, I pray that you might know that you have eternal life and that you would continue to put your faith in the God who loved you and gave his life for you. Father, guide us and strengthen us by your word. In Jesus' name, amen.